I V M. Land, labor, capital, enterprise. The basic ingredients of any economic activity and production. In India, all of them are in desperate need of reform. On this episode of the Pragati Podcast, Shekhar Shah and Pranab Ranjan Chaudhary give us a masterclass on land, property rights and reforms, as well as what India needs to do in 2020. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, a weekly talk show on public policy, economics and international relations. We take a step back from noisy political debates and dive into rich conversations on India and the world. I am your host, Pavan Srinath. We'll start this episode's conversation after a short break. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money and Intel. We appreciate their support. It's been a fantastic week on the IVM Network. I hope that you've been checking stuff out, but some of the highlights that you definitely should check out. Ashish Vidyarthi, host of Begin the Journey, was on Cyrus Says. They had a really fun conversation. I think you'll enjoy that. Uncle Please Sid did an episode around development, which was really, really fun. On Edges and Sledges, we had Adam Holio, former England captain. While wow, those guys are killing it one cricketer after the other. Definitely do check out Advertising is Dead. We talk about esports with some really guys who really know that space. Smile India, absolutely right. These guys are killing it as well. So is Pawan at Pragati. Don't forget the original things. Again, one of my favorite shows. You must, must, must check that out. It's just been a really fun week, folks. I hope that you enjoy it. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast. On today's episode, we want to understand land and property rights and what land reforms were, are, and ought to be in 2020. Let me introduce our guest today who will help us make sense of it all. Dr. Shekhar Shah is an economist and the Director General of NCAER, the National Council for Applied Economic Research, one of India's premier think tanks as well as one of the oldest, going back to 1956. While Dr. Shah is joining us from Delhi, Mr. Pranab Ranjan Chaudhary joins us from Sambalpur in Odisha. He works with the Center for Land Governance and has been working for close to two decades on natural resources management and land governance across the country. I want to start our conversation today by asking you, Dr. Shah, if I own farmland near a highway in rural Karnataka, do I really own it? If I own a flat in a large city like Bengaluru, do I truly own it? Great question. I think it kind of uh, embodies within it uh, all that uh, has been done, the legacy that we've inherited from the British uh, and what needs to be done. So if you own farmland, as you said, in uh, near Bangalore or a flat, you are a legal property owner and you have a piece of paper, presumably says that, but it only records the transfer uh, of the title. It is what you registered as a deed when you bought the farmland or the, the flat. And in technical parlance, people call it, lawyers call it presumptive title, not a conclusive title. And what's the difference? The presumptive title is the person who pays the tax. And this is history that we can go into that goes back to revenue collection by the British, which is how we have the land records that we do have now. And that's really the situation. So yes, you, uh, you do not have conclusive ownership that is guaranteed by the state, but the state simply registers through a deed the transaction that led to your ownership. Thank you, Dr. Shah. So from what I understand, there was a constitutional fundamental right to property for a very brief period around 1950 before it got removed. So in that sense, if we don't have a constitutional right to property, is it just this sort of transactional right? There is just some record that I notionally own this? Like, do I have a statutory right? Can you help me understand that a little bit? You do have a right, and the Constitution does provide us this right of uh, ownership of property. It is the way in which that ownership is recorded and guaranteed by the state that is the serious and the biggest problem. And this has many manifestations. So, for example, using of land, and land is the biggest asset that households in India own. Some 65% of uh, assets are very often seen in land on average in India. So when you go to a bank and you say, I have this property, if you had conclusive title, it would be very simple for the bank to 
give you a loan equal to whatever the market value of the property is. But because you don't have that conclusive title, you are presumed to be the owner. You have presumptive title. And for that reason, then the bank will say, well, what other assets do you have? So work done by uh, colleagues at the Vidhi Center suggests that, you know, if we had those kinds of property rights, that would unleash a great deal of investment capital that would come forth. Currently, banks are not in a position to do that because they do not have access to clear title that is available in many other countries. Thank you. So does this also mean that I have the notional right to my property under sort of sufferance of the government. So if the government decides tomorrow that I no longer own this property, that it has the right to take this away? Or is that a very difficult question to answer in India? Well, eminent domain always means that the government does have both the ability to guarantee your ownership, as well as it can seek under certain laws, all of those relate to public purpose, to acquire your land. Now that Acquisition of land can be through a market transaction where they simply buy it from you, or they may do it under different elements of a law that will compensate you in some way or the other. And so, you know, the India's had a act from 1894 going back all the way to early British days called the Land Acquisition Act. And till 2013, under different amendments, that is the act that governed the acquisition of land by the government from a private entity. Thereafter, we've had a new act, the 2013 Land Acquisition Act, which has had many changes made in that process, focusing particularly on compensation, rehabilitation, etc. So yes, the, the government can take away your land, but not without due process. Pawan, can I uh, compliment what Professor Sa uh, responded to this question? Certainly. Yeah, so the answer, as you were telling, I would tell uh, to, to the first set of questions, the legend of farmland and flat, is both yes and no. Why I'm telling it yes and no, there are three reasons for that. Uh, because in India, you don't always own land legally. So I would say, uh, uh, no, we can look at it in three angles. So sometimes we own land legally, sometimes we own land informally. Like we call informal, a uh, lot of informal settlement in Bangalore. I, I believe there are many settlements where now they are regularizing uh, just to uh, get post COVID some fund coming of uh, Karnataka. So there is some land which you are not legally owned, but informally you own it and sometimes they are regularized. And many people in the slums do, do that. Then something is legal as well as financial, like you own it and uh, this, this can be mortgaged and sale. So then we need to interestingly know what is this legally and financial and legally owned. So if you look at the legal owned land in India, so it is a continuum. Like Professor Sa was telling, in India, we have this deed uh, registration, deed title system, so which is different from conclusive titling. So deed registration system is not so bad. It is in many uh, you know, countries in the world. Conclusive is also in some countries. So difference is that in the presumptive and conclusive is that in presumptive title system, the owner is on the land owner to prove that you are the owner of the land. So just by mere registering a land with a register or uh, no sub-register or mutating uh, in the land records uh, doesn't make you the owner, though you become the first claimant and legally everything goes to you. But again, you have to defend that. Even if you have a land record, sometimes the bankers, they don't like bank lawyer particularly who takes, a, you know, bankers take a legal opinion from the lawyer before they give you a mortgage for anything you know to construct a house or you want to send your children to a foreign country. So they would evaluate it. And many times, even if you have a legal title, even you don't manage to get loan. So even within a legal title, sometimes we just register it and we believe that registration deed is you know, as good as a record. No, registration like as per India's Registration Act, even uh, Pawan can sell me the Taj Mahal and the registration authority will be registering it because they just <laughs> register a transaction. Yeah, so, so they don't verify that. So uh, that means the registration document has nothing unless it is mutated in the record, which follow a due diligence process. Right. So that way, you know, the, the legacy issue, the way the records are maintained, the way lawyers and you know, judges interpret it really make the things more complex. So, so one of the phrases that we see thrown around a lot is this idea of a land reform, right? And it feels like it means very different 
things to very different people and it likely also meant very different things at very different times. So Mr. Chaudhary, maybe you can start us off on this. Could you walk us through how India thought about and uh, implemented land reform, say from the 50s when we abrogated this constitutional fundamental right to property till perhaps the 80s? See, when India got independent, it was a kind of very socialistic kind of you no know, uh, state and state wanted that uh, the major reason of poverty in India is because of the Jamindari system who are taking it and Britishers because for Britishers and Jamindar the major income was from land revenue and land was regarded as the major source of income for them and because people they were taxing so much and there was no rights to the tenants and rares. So the first thing government of India wanted to do is that you no know, uh, see if land reform can be brought in in the context that land is given to tiller. So tillers means the cultivator. So the first phase of land was brought, was brought around 60s, late 50s and 60s in different states because land is a state subject in uh, India. That means state has to pass the act uh, of land except for acquisition, which is part of the uh, government of India. So the state started passing this uh, you know, land reform act, like Karnataka, it is all states that started passing it. And uh, the three principles in the land reform act was there. One is the land, the whatever Jamidari system is that they are the intermediaries who were holding land for the Britishers and uh, you know, distributing people. So every year they, they can change the tenants. With their uh, Britishers more uh, major concern was to collect the land revenue. So they were not worried about who is cultivating as long as they were getting the uh, payment. And uh, they all sometimes for a permanent settlement, you, know, you must have heard of that, you know, they were fixing a particular rate. So they were also not worried how much rate is being charged by the Jamidar. So it was a very exploitative system. So the first thing was that the Jamidari abolitions would be coming in. And second thing was that the tenants who are cultivating the land, they will be given the right and uh, tenancy protection, uh, what you call. And third was that, you no know, ceilings. So because uh, it was more aimed at a socialist mindset, so it was uh, based on principle of redistributive justice. So they were looking at that whoever owning more land, if you can put a ceiling and get acquire less rest of the land and then distribute among the poor people, so that will be a good initiative. So these three principles were the principal land reform. Even that led to the first uh, no, amendment uh, of the constitution uh, against right to property because they were feeling that if the land is taken away from these people, they will go to court and they will make it messy. So the first amendment was basically to not allow these people to challenge that in the court to do, do away with that. But the way the land reform was implemented, you know, there are a lot of vested interests because a lot of the leaders, political leaders, a lot of bureaucrats, a lot of you know, powerful people, they were the landowners. So they were not very you know, comfortable with this reform coming in and you know, uh, giving away the land. So in many states, the land reform process got delayed in implementation while the act, for example, in Orissa, the act was drafted in 1960, but by the time it is fully implemented, it was 1975. And then what happened, initially they had a higher area under land ceiling, then gradually they you know, reduced it. So as a result of which, the ceiling surplus redistribution was not very effective. Uh, now, till 2016, roughly some 2 million hectares have only been you know, redistributed. This is across the country or uh, this is in Orissa? Uh, what is a few thousand hectares? So it is uh, across the okay. country. So, okay. yeah, so the land reform agenda remained no unfinished in terms of ceiling surplus and also tenancy. Tenancy continued because many states, what happened in the reform laws, many states banned the tenancy, but many states also protected the tenants. Like uh, the Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, in some other states, if you continue for some years, you have the priority, you know, privilege to buy the land, or if you continue for 12 years, even you can take the land. So those kind of tenancy was either given outright to the land or they were given some kind of protection. But what that lead to that land, because India uh, you know, inherits very feudal kind of you know, relations, land relations and also caste structure. So the lower caste and the lower uh, land size farmer, they didn't have a bargaining power. So as a result of which this tenancy you know, continued in an informal concealed way. So even as of now, as per the estimates which are recorded, which you know, uh, researchers say gross underestimate, so about 25 to 30 percent of farmers in India are tenants. So land reform, in a way, which was primarily in India called about you know, agriculture land reform, reduced land reform, they remain 
on finish. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. I just want to get a quick opinion from Dr. Shah on this as well. I mean, land reforms, when we are talking about redistribution in this sense, right, it feels like a wicked economic problem because traditional ownership is... Uh, as Mr. Chaudhary mentioned, dominated by various caste equations and so on. And there were many people who were under sort of the societal norms and laws were just not allowed from owning land, even if they were doing all the things surrounding that piece of land. So is this a wicked problem that is just impossible to solve well? Or how should we be thinking about this? Because I get the idea that if you have this right to property on top of centuries of caste, it perpetuates the same problem, but the solution seems to be as bad as the problem itself. Well, it certainly does qualify as a wicked problem. But I think we do have some understanding of how one can begin to solve these problems. Just reflecting back on what uh, Pranab said, one of the most serious problems of policymaking in our country, and I think this is very obvious in the way in which uh, land reforms have proceeded over the years, is that we do not make a distinction between the law and its implementation, or as lawyers would put it, the jure and the de facto. The de jure is the best laws in the world. The de facto is actually what's on the ground and how those laws will get implemented. So in each of the instances where we started first with agrarian reform, where land back to the tiller, Then we went ahead and talked about a ceiling, uh, a land ceiling, so that we could redistribute the land. These were all well-motivated, well-intentioned, de jure uh, actions by the state, because this is the society we would like to have. Unfortunately, many of these do not take into account the incentives that individual economic agents or individuals or landowners or tenants need. And Pranab referred to some of this. In the first instance, the idea was land is very unproductive because the tiller has no incentive to invest in it simply because he doesn't own it. He gets very little out of it. The zamindar extracted a lot out of the tenant and paid whatever he had to pay to the British. So this is the reaction that we had. Let's return the land to the tiller. Unfortunately, when we tried to do that, the people who were in a position, so they were given permanent rights on this. The tenancy reforms happened. Tenancy reforms also made it possible for future tenants to uh, have those same rights. So landlords then started leaving land fallow because they did not want to bring in sharecroppers or tenants that they would never be able to uh, get out of those contracts. And more so, they stopped recording the tenancy arrangements that they were making so that now the record started getting out of the kind of mirror principle that Pranab talked about. So that was one. The second was the the ceiling laws meant that we started seeing Benami recordings and Benami registrations where a number of fictitious names were added to land records. So again, we had a divergence between what was on the ground who actually occupied and owned the land on the ground and what was reflected in the record. So these are some of the ways in which a complex problem is made even more complex because we don't think through the actual implications of what is happening. But I do agree it's a complex problem, but not one that cannot be solved. And several states have started doing this uh, in the country, Maharashtra, uh, others, where they are moving much more to giving title Uh, whether through uh, new areas that are coming under uh, inhabitation or by not moving to what is called conclusive titling, but really employing a real-time mirror principle where the digitized land records more and more closely match what's on the ground so that through a process of improvement, we will get to many of the advantages of that kind of conclusive titling that we are seeking. Just to you know, highlight an example around Dalits. So as you told that you create problems, so Dalits were not allowed to own land. And if you remember, the very person who drafted the constitution of India, he called upon in a rally, public rally in Maharashtra to Dalit to grab government land. Dr. Ambedkar once was so frustrated with the scenarios. So he asked Dalits to break the law and grab government land. So that led to a movement of grabbing the land. But what happened in few, you know, in the in future, 
when the ceiling land was i was taking that ceiling land as per record was redistributed 2 million hectares 2.7 some million hectares but if you look at the positions in many states the land position could not take place even dalits could not possess the land but fortunately as dr ganosha was telling some states like uh, andhra pradesh brought in a act called srep and srep you know, bhumi around that they tried to have you no know, kind of legal counseling punjab did something you know a different day of auctioning bihar did something where they brought in some you no know, kind of you no know, police force to enter into villages and you know find out where they are not given the position so the law has to be backed up with a you know very good implementation strategy so some states have shown shown their political uh, willingness that bureaucratic you no know, commitment and tried to uh, change the you no know, this whole uh, wicked agrarian relation but still many states have not been able to do that i want to have one specific follow up here i mean i think we've gotten a good sense of the rural land dynamics around this right what about adivasis in the large tribal population in india which lives adjacent to forests in forests and in situations which are even more complex and perhaps even more wicked than the rural challenge that we have see when the 50s this land reform laws came up also many state realized uh, that the tribal areas where there has been issues around land grabbing by you know powerful people so britishers had earlier no uh, declared them as agency areas which were uh, later converted to post independent as sidul areas like in the mainland uh, we call it sidul 5 areas and in the north east india it is called sidul 6 areas so sidul areas the land governance is with directly with the governor and there are some uh, administrators uh, who look at the land and around sidul areas many state brought in a different land act which provide protection to the tribals so the land reform laws as well as the uh, this tribal uh, protection laws uh, did allow the tribal land to be captured by the non tribals so there was a very strict stringent law and even when it was reviewed in you know early 90s so it was found that in spite of this many many lands have been taken away even by the government you know state government for panchayat uh, buildings for the roads so those lands uh, in early 2000 restored back to the tribals so that was one kind of movement where some progress was made but that was not enough then what happened then it was realized this way the forest is reserved the way the forest reservation takes place as per forest i know this indian forest act many times they don't take into account the you no know, rights of the tribals who live inside forest or cultivate inside forest state of shifting cultivation so most of their rights were denied and the forest were reserved they were branded as encroacher most of the court cases were lying against the tribals so in 2005 you know enactment of this historic india they call it forest right act which talks about undoing the historical injustice so about 40 million hectares of land where the forest rights can come in which in fact more than 50% of india's forest area and uh, this would be you know in one fourth of villages of india and you know uh, helping about 150 million tribals uh, so as of now i think only 12 to 13% of those lands have been settled with some states like maharashtra chatisgarh and odisha taking the lead but other states have not done much the issue of uh, adivasis and tribals also has to do a lot with the legal regimes around mining around forests uh, i have already mentioned that so they are in conflict with uh, uh, the sort of industrial manufacturing natural resource extraction elements of our economy and those are also things that need to be sorted out very often but overall the legal regimes uh, have not really done as good a job again going back to that de jure and de facto uh, on paper we have all the great laws but we are not able to implement them and if you look at the displacement due to development development and due to displacement in india be it you know, river valley project be it mining companies be it roads so most of the displacement burden has been borne by the tribals certainly so this is one area where tribals you know i have even interacted with some tribal families in odisha who have been displaced thrice wow to river valley projects to you know milk plants then to nalcos all public sector plants and they have taken huge areas and most of the time they don't use that those areas and the tribal state is there so this is one issue second issue is that many states have also brought in a kind of no act around government land settlement favoring tribals the prioritizing tribal development where many tribals have been also allocated 
lad because uh, all these things like this forest right you know denial the denial of displacement made what of the most of tribal landless so tribal landless is a big issue in india so many states try to address that by giving them allocating them government land because in most of the tribal areas government land percentage is very high so that has been also a positive side of it so there is you know we have to look at the two sides so state has tried to do it but when the state's intent is there state's willingness is there but as the professor sir told disure and then the power relations and the feudal relations in the field sometimes deny the tribal fair right thank you so much let's take a quick break and we'll come back नमस्ते मैं हूं सौरभ चंद्रा और मैं प्रणय कोटिस्थानी जब महफिल खत्म होते होते दरवाजे के बाहर पुलिया के ऊपर हम दुनिया भर की जटिल समस्याओं को सॉल्व करने में लग जाते हैं तो हो जाती है पुलियाबाजी अब आजकल के अपार्टमेंट वालों ने तो कभी पुलिया देखी नहीं होगी पर आप फीलिंग तो समझ ही सकते हैं तो आइए शामिल हो जाइए हमारी पुलियाबाजी में जहाँ प्रणय और मैं एक से एक इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक्स की तह तक जाएंगे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस बिटकॉइन पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एजुकेशन करेंसी क्राइसिस कभी हम दोनों के साथ और अक्सर स्पेशल एक्सपर्ट गेस्ट की कंपनी में सुनिए हमें आई की वेबसाइट ऐप या अपने फेवरेट पॉडकास्टिंग प्लेटफॉर्म आरोप हर दूसरे हफ्ते Welcome back to the Pragati podcast. We are having a very important discussion on land property rights reforms and what that means in 2020. Dr. Shah, I want to talk to you about the Land Record Services Index, but before that, why is it that in India we talk more about land acquisition than land reforms? Is an acquisition when every other means of the sale or transaction of land has failed and the government has to use its coercive force to take land away from people and give it to somebody else it's a great question pavan um i think by land acquisition we really mean the transfer of land away from a particular land use to potentially an industrial or a service based uh, land use so i think that's the broader context of land acquisition that we think about whether it's for a large manufacturing plant or whether it's for some kind of a service industry but typically it's manufacturing that needs or natural resource uh, based industries that need land I think this has to be seen in the context of uh, every country's move up its development scale where we find that agriculture becomes more and more productive releases a lot of people from the land and therefore land becomes something that is to be used for other purposes in our country we are not really leveraging the use of private and public land to the extent that other countries are that this land is not releasing the funds or the kind of leveraging that happens when land can be mortgaged or or transactions happen so it's in that broader context of of land acquisition that we need to think about this the problem here has been that the pendulum has swung from a position that was the old land acquisition act of 1894 which was truly completely tilted in favor of the state or the private acquirer of land now we have moved to a new act the 2013 act where the pendulum has swung completely the other way where it becomes very difficult for anybody to acquire land for any legitimate purpose in the end what do we want we want welfare we don't want to keep people just on the land we want people to have opportunity we want people to have a healthy income we want to let them have good jobs to save to become prosperous that should be the goal of any country it's not to keep farmers on the land that would not be the right way of seeing development so it's in that context that the need for land has become greater and greater as our industrialization as our manufacturing and service industries have taken off and because there are so many distortions in land records because they don't reflect what is clearly owned some estimates suggest that between 65% to 80% of all litigation in our court civil litigation is land related that demonstrates how poorly our land markets work where transactions cannot happen easily and the cost of transactions is very high uh we've seen this in some very prominent cases where large industrial houses wanted to set up manufacturing operations uh and were not able to successfully acquire land in certain states they were then allowed or were able to acquire land in other states now 
if we are thinking of overall development, we absolutely have to release land for these purposes, but in a equitable way, in a way in which the owners of the land get due compensation. But these distortions in the land markets, the land records being a poor reflection of what is actually on the ground, make all this extremely difficult to do. And that's why this idea of land acquisitions always comes up when we talk about what we do with land. So in that sense, Dr. Shah, would it be fair to say that the value of land accrues to the people who are capable of changing the land use rather than those who own the land in the first place? Exactly. Uh, Because the owners of land do not get the true value of that land because of regulations, because of poor land records. So land transfers happen at subpar values of the real economic value of the land. The original owner may get only a fraction of the true economic value of that land. Then the person who purchases it, if they have political power, if they have influence, if they have the ability to cut corners, if they have the ability to provide bribes, can actually create that economic value for themselves through a change in the land use of that particular parcel of land. So in that sense, you're exactly right that the usage pattern, this is again where inappropriate regulation of the kind that we saw earlier with the urban ceilings of the the land ceiling acts, all of those come together and they create the situation where the true owner of the land, the original owner of the land does not get the value. The person who is able to convert the land use then reaps the great benefit that comes from achieving the true economic value of that land. So then in an ideal situation, when does something like eminent domain come into play? Right? I guess eminent domain is a term that we might use more in the United States than in India. But the idea that the government says that, hey, for a public purpose, for a national purpose. So therefore, I will intervene and I will supersede sort of market transactions and other things and come in. So in an ideal scenario, where should we limit that eminent domain discussion to as opposed to where we are in India right now, where a whole host of things fall under this land acquisition bucket? I think the concern is mostly with the private uh, acquisition of land, not so much with the public acquisition of land. There are, of course, some very prominent cases, uh, the Narmada case, the other cases where these things became very important. But by and large, uh, the concern is with the private acquisition of land because it's the private conversion of land use that creates the situation where the purchaser then gains the value. But perhaps Pranab has a view on this as well. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, See, if you look at the acquisition, I know uh, there are a lot of complexities around acquisition, if you layer it, one layer is around the way the land arbitration is taking place, like the land record, the way land records are created. And another is about, like as you told, this whole public domain, uh, the public purpose, eminent domain, uh, fair compensation. So if you layer it, no, uh, most of the land, uh, the way we record it in India, we, we do a very linear kind of recording. Like we look at the land and who is owning. But if you look at it, every land, there are you know, different kind of rights and uh, by different people like in land rights, we call it you know, uh, land right paradigm, we call it continuum of land right or a bundle of land right. Like there is a user right, there is access right, there is a management right, there is this right many times overlap, then there is a, you know, right to alienate, which is the you know, highest form of land right. So these rights sometimes exist together and for a particular land, it could be many rights by many people. So many times, so conflicts have come up just to just because the access is denied. Uh, it is not about ownership. They wanted access to a river and uh, the particular industry wanted to acquire the land and put up a boundary do, without giving a road. Wanted to look at a process of due diligence, who are the claimants? So if you don't identify the claimants, which has not been you know, properly recorded in land record, then the conflicts are going to come in future. So that is number one. Now, number two is about compensation. If you look at most of the court cases in Supreme Court that was analyzed by this Central Policy Research by our friend Namita Wahi, she found that most of the court cases in Supreme Court uh, around acquisition 1894 Act, channelized till 90s, late 90s, were around compensation amount. 
So Aju told correctly the, the land value has to be said, but what share goes to the people who are owning the land? What share goes to the poor uh, landless who are depending on government land? Because earlier there was no, uh, no right on the government land compensation. Now this Lair Act is trying to provide that. So these are something we need to uh, understand that if the land is to be you now given to a best use where it will create more value for the new user, the old users should not lose out. If the old user stake can be built in and old user can be given a good share of it, then probably you no know, the investment can be more sustainable. So for a corporate for industry, land, labor, capital are equally important. But you see uh, you know, corporate governance, there has been a lot of you no know, expertise and a lot of resources spent on financial management and labor relations, labor management, HR, but around land, they don't exist. So most of them it is out, either outsourced. So we are trying to now contact with the corporate you know, departments dealing with land. So they are so dispersed. Sometimes they are in the HR, sometimes they are in legal, they are sometimes they are in finance, sometimes they are in CSR, sometimes they are in R and R. So there is no land engagement, you know, corporate governance, there is no space for land engagement. There is no land expertise. So that's why there has been always a kind of misses, underestimation of the threat and also a kind of over reliance on government that government can answer everything, which is increasingly failing. If I could compliment that, uh, Pan, just on this point, uh, and again, take it back to the problem with land records that we have. There are four or five things that land records should really faithfully record. One is, of course, the possession of the ownership of the land, which can, as uh, Prabhu was saying, can be different from the possession of the land. The actual area of the land itself and its coordinates so that we are clear about which land we are talking about. The usage of the land, so the classification of the land. And finally, the encumbrances on the land. Our records are very poor in all these five dimensions. When these records are poor, then it is very difficult both for the owner as well as the purchaser of land to make a efficient transfer of this and markets then pricing the land correctly because there is such opacity over all these aspects, the usage pattern of the land, the encumbrance on the land, the actual possession of the land, the true owner of the land, the area of the land, all these are shrouded. When they are shrouded, even well-meaning people are unable to put a true market value. And that's why we have to depend on the so-called circle values. These are notional values of the price of land. So we don't have price discovery happening efficiently for a huge asset that the country has. And as a result of that, there are knock-on efficiencies all through the system, the corporate aspects of this that Pranab talked about, but also an individual. When you go to buy a piece of land, it becomes incredibly difficult for you to understand what the true market value should be. Thank you, Dr. Shah. That brings me neatly to the question uh, about the recent research by NCAR about this land record services index. So from what I understand, you have tried to look at all states across these various parameters and see if they've put in better systems in place whereby the history of land and the spatial dimensions of the land records have been modernized and systematized better. So what do you see from this study? I mean, I personally was shocked to see that Karnataka was very much in the middle of the pack and we had states like Madhya Pradesh and Odisha, which have uh, taken the lead. Do you tell us a little more about the study and what you were able to find uh, across Indian states? This was an attempt by NCER to try to bring the status of land records in the context of the big moves that happened once we got over some of the older issues of land reform and land redistribution. The focus very much became how can we use technology to record the patterns of uh, land ownership or possession or however, a little better. So uh, this led eventually to the Digital Land Records Modernization Program of the Government of India, where there is expected to be uh, a closer relationship between what is on the Patwari's books, the textual record, then the spatial record, which is the cadastral map of the land itself, the way in which land is registered or land transactions are registered, and then ultimately 
which goes back to the mirror principle, how well do these land records actually relate to what's on the ground in terms of the ownership, uh, whether there's joint ownership, the use that the land is being put to, the area of the land itself, and what encumbrances there are. So our effort in the Land Records and Services Index, and this, by the way, is just the first edition of it. There's a lot that needs to be done. We looked state by state at the nature of the textual record and the digitization of the records, how much uh, land records had been digitized, the availability of legally usable copies of the record of rights, as it's called. Can I get a legally usable copy that I can use with a commercial bank, for example, to get a loan? The second aspect we looked at was the spatial record, the digitization of the cadastral map itself, and the availability of legally usable copies of that cadastral map. And then the registration, the public entry of the data, the way in which circle rates were available, the way in which uh, a purchaser had to pay the stamp duty and the registration fee. Essentially, how easy was it to register uh, your transaction? And finally, through spot checks, the quality of the land records itself in the dimensions that I mentioned. So we did this for states. And this is not an easy task because the entire land record process under the constitution resides with the states. The states inherited different legacies from the British of how their land records were maintained. And those legacies persist even today. So that land record administration in states really varies greatly state to state. We've attempted in this land record services index for the first time Uh, to try to bring them on a common platform. And obviously, there are going to be anomalies that we have to deal with. On your specific question of why Karnataka ranked 15th in this ranking of states by these dimensions, the real problem there was that the cadastral maps were not on the web. And for that reason, they got a zero score Uh, for that. And uh, the states that did much better in this case, uh, the ones that you mentioned at the top of the rankings, Madhya Pradesh and Odisha, they uh, did much, much better on the digitalization of the, the cadastral maps being available on the web. Now, the point of this is not to slot states as good states and bad states. The whole point of doing this LRSI is twofold or threefold. First, that Karnataka being a developed state, one of the richest states, we are pointing out something that can easily be done and it would substantially improve Karnataka's ranking. Karnataka's ranking on many of the other aspects that I mentioned is actually quite high, quite close to, for example, Odisha's uh, rankings. So a simple change in the availability of these cadastral maps would greatly help on the spatial record dimensions of our index, the state to move up the ranking. So this is really designed to incentivize states to think about the gaps that they currently have in their land records and how those gaps can be easily fixed. I'll tell you one aspect of this prioritization that our land record services index makes possible. This is when we released the report, we had a person official from Sikkim saying to us that for the first time, there is evidence that they as the officials can take the political uh, leaders of the state when they are told we need to improve land records. Now they have the ability to say, yes, this is the priority ranking of the things we need to do because now LRSI has kind of shown us that we are doing very poorly relative to other states in this particular dimension. And so clearly this is something that should have higher priority. So it's enabling internally a conversation within states as well to allow them to prioritize what they should be doing. So that's uh, the idea. But at the moment, I should mention that we've only looked at the availability of these land records. We have not yet looked at how households are using these land records. And in future revisions and and enhancements of this uh, index, we very much want to go to households and ask them their view and their perception of the usability of these land records. Rankings can be so interesting when 
they provide an impetus to and a roadmap for change, right? And also a measure by which people can one structure their conversations for change and two also be able to measure themselves rather than as you said just look at absolute rankings and see you know who's at which position and uh, not so let's come to 2020 we are now recording this online in the middle of a pandemic you know, we've had a series of lockdowns and now we are in a mode where we're trying to get back to some kind of a new normal so in this new normal, I want to ask both of you, how do you see the role of land? I mean, there's recently some talk of attracting foreign investment because there might be some investment, especially manufacturing capital that might be leaving China, the, the, all kinds of geopolitical forces at play. If you were to define the land reform agenda today, where would you start? Would you again start from the land services and the records? And where would we take it from there? So I would take it like into the four different geographies of India. So it should not be focusing only on one geography. You try to focus that on the industrial kind of thing. I'll talk about that. So COVID is really connecting land with development paradigms. The way migrants went back home, the way slum dwellers faced the problem, the way migrants earlier came to, cyclic came to the cities, they reflect the land relations and labor relations. And one thing they have underlined very clearly is the informalities around both. So India has been struggling uh, with informalities around land and labor and more so around land uh, post uh, no, liberalization. So which is you know, the COVID has exposed and we need to address it. So how do we address it? So if you look at, so I'll, I'll move to rural first and come to industrial thing last. If you look at the rural India, so now additional 10 million people, they have converged in rural India. And as we are looking at literature and the psychological issues, many of them may not be willing to come back at all, or many of them willing to come back soon. So how are you going to provide them you no know, engagement in rural India, provide them food in rural India? So in that context, we argue that land leasing reform that was you know, suggested by uh, Niti Ayo 2016 has a potential to address because every village had some fallow land and every village has a landless population. So examples like SREP in Andhra Pradesh, Kudumbasri in Kerala has demonstrated that village level institutions can help in you know, providing some kind of leasing, informal leasing arrangement. So if you can formalize the leasing, it will also add investment to that. So for example, in a village, you have got 100 hectares of fallow land and there are about 20 farmers, landless farmers or tenant farmers who are migrating to cities because land relations are not there. Because what is happening, there is a disadvantage for a landless tenant farmer. Even if they cultivate the same piece of land and get the same yield as compared to a owner farmer, they are disadvantaged because they will be sharing the resources. They don't get any government benefit. So that makes their agriculture far less profitable and forcing them to go to the city. So if if, if you can formalize leasing relations, and allow the rental market to come in, they also get, get you know, credit, insurance, MSP facilities. So that will not only boost up the agriculture production and boost up the rural economy, but also add substantial employment to them. So coming to also tribal India, we're looking at the data sets uh, due to resource cost, due to mining. Most of the people you know, from Jharkhand, from Odisha are also migrating from tribal areas to cities. So if you can you know, expedite forest right reform, if you can bring in, you know, uh, along with forest life, like value chains around that, so that will be also helpful in settling these people. Coming to urban India, see, one of the things when you look at the smart cities, the cities have been smart, you know, the way they're planned, they're looking at infrastructure, communication, everything, but they're completely forgotten the city builders, the slum dwellers. So most of the cities, they don't have space for those people. They encroach upon land, they stay in the slums. And slums are the places where you find the, this kind of pandemics you know, perpetuate faster. So in Europe, in the you know, 20s, after the flu pandemic, they restructured the cities to make it more cleaner, healthier for the you know, workers. So time has come. Probably India need to look at how to reform their slum areas, how to reserve land for you know, the city builders, how to bring in a kind of rental reform, which will provide a kind of people who are you know, coming to cities uh, not for or like ever for five point six months or so sometimes can you have an airbnb for these people uh, in the cities can you have rental reform which can help them 
And last but the not the least, as you look at now, now there are uh, statuses going around. Uh, India uh, requires double the size of Luxembourg area to invite the industries from China. And now UP has trying to improve the land banks. Andhra Pradesh and Telangana looking at land pooling. Karnataka has already reformed their land reform law, allowing industry to directly purchase from the farmers. Uh, so when this rat race has begun, one thing we must also remember, which we discussed while discussing land acquisition, this is these are something which may not this 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 de facto cosmetic surgeries may look better. There is no shortcut to improving land records. There is no shortcut to go looking at how this land tenure due diligence to be done, how better compensation can be provided, how corporate can be directly engaged with the community. So those institutional measures are also has to be looked at while we also look at these reforms. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, Dr. Shah? To supplement the very important things that Pranav has talked about, we really have to look at good faith efforts in the past. For example, the restrictions on land leasing where we were concerned about people being dispossessed or in some way scammed out of uh, their possessions. That, in effect, has led to the informality that Pranab talked about and the concealed tenancies without any security of tenure. So we really need to make sure that our good faith efforts at trying to prevent abuse don't actually result in concealed abuse, which then is even harder to police is even harder to undo. So land leasing is truly an extremely important aspect. I mentioned the Niti Aayog study that was done in 2016. There was also a Model Agricultural Land Leasing Act prepared by Niti. These things need to get a lot of attention. The government, in a very timely way, has uh, started a scheme called Swamitva, uh, which is looking at the Abadi land in villages. This is land which the British never sought to survey because their purpose in surveying land was land which actually generated income, which they could tax. There's no wonder why the, the main administrator in every district was called the district collector you know what he collected. So we need to move away from that. And the Swamitva scheme using drone technology is proposing to give rights to the Abadi land. This is the inhabited land in villages, which again has no survey right now. Maharashtra has taken the lead and Pranab and the person in Maharashtra who's been leading this work, Mr. Chokalingam, have written about the Swamitva scheme. So there's a lot of hope that the Swamitva scheme will give uh, rights to the inhabitants of the village inhabited land. And that will then translate into their being able to raise capital against that land so as to both use it for urgent consumption needs as well as for enterprises and other things that they may wish to invest in. So I think that's going to be an important area. Another area that I think we really ought to be looking at in the current context, and I want to go back to the DMAT experience, where we took physical shares of the entire country, individual share holdings, and converted them into digital formats that were then held by a fiduciary. We need to move towards that kind of a slow but very sure process of being able to keep our land records in centralized repositories that then can be accessed by funders, by creditors, by borrowers, by people who look at research on land market values. We don't currently have that. And the balkanization of uh, different land record systems around the country now need to be unified. We've done the GST We need to do something that is similar in land records where we bring them on a common platform. They are available digitally and they can unleash truly a major expansion of the capital and the funding available for investment in our country in rural areas and peri-urban areas, in urban areas. I think that's a big step we need to take coming out of this pandemic. And none of these require highly centralized solutions, right? We can retain land as a state subject where states have the primary owners of lawmaking, but still have systems that work across the country. 
Absolutely. I think states would see that they retain legislative and statutory control, but they conform to common standards. And those common standards increase their revenue, for example, from these very lands, because land transactions become easier. They then derive the stamp fees or whatever that is imposed on those land transactions. And everybody can gain from that, the seller, the buyer, and the regulator or the taxer all gain from systematizing land records, putting them on a national platform, using the principles that we learned in the DMAT process, which was relatively painless and highly successful. Uh, And we need to use those same learnings from that process to apply them to land records. Mr. Chaudhary, Dr. Shah, thank you so much for joining me on the Prakriti podcast and truly educating me and all our listeners about how to really think about land and reform. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. This felt like a masterclass from the both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pavan. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Pavan. Thank you for staying with us till the end. If you have any questions or comments, do write in to podcast at thinkpragati.com. And hey, if you like the podcast and listen to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. It'll mean a lot to us. The Pragati Podcast is available on the IVM Podcast app and pretty much every other podcast app and platform. We are there everywhere. Namaskar, this is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times. But in these challenging times, we can create something extraordinary. Do take time to listen to my podcast, Begin the Journey. Available on the IVM podcast, website, app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember, we have a great opportunity called life. Cheers. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries, suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rena, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website or wherever you listen to podcasts.